Anyway, uh, if you have been with us at all throughout the course of this year, if, if not, we're glad you're with us tonight, but you know that we're in a year-long study called The Story of Jesus, looking at the life of the greatest man who ever lived from the accounts of his life in the four gospel accounts. One gospel, four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've been sort of picking and choosing as we've gone throughout the course of this year. This current series we're in, which is coming to a close here this weekend, is a, story, is a series on the parables called Kingdom Stories, Stories of the Kingdom. Parables, stories Jesus told about life in the kingdom. But a parable is a particular kind of story. We've talked about this throughout the series, but in case you haven't been with us or you're forgetful like me, parable comes from the Greek word parabale. Two words, para meaning with, bale to throw or cast alongside of. Literally, the word means to lay beside or throw beside. So Jesus would take stories about everyday life, sowers and seeds and people on a journey and fathers and sons and workers in a vineyard and dinner parties and all these normal everyday things, and he would lay them alongside or cast them alongside deep spiritual truths to, to explain to us what life in the kingdom is like. Because there's some things about God's kingdom that you can't define or give bullet points, but you can describe in a story. This, that's what we've been trying to look at in depth as we've gone in this series. So, as a way of introduction to this story, how many of you have ever come across an invitation to a party or a wedding or an RSVP and you found it in that drawer or on your desk where all the stacks of papers are and you forgot to RSVP or you couldn't remember if you did? Ever happened to somebody? You're like, oh, is that today? We never told them we're coming and I want to have steak and chicken, not steak or chicken, right? <laughs> I do lots of weddings as a pastor and I, my wife is constantly telling me, you still have to RSVP. Because I have to tell them if I'm coming. I figure they know I'm coming. I'm the pastor. I'm doing the wedding. But it's always embarrassing to her because I never bring those invitations home or send them in. I forget to anyway. And so we're always finding out and people are having to call the pastor and asking, are you coming? Anyway, believe it or not, Jesus told stories about this kind of thing. At least one story. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. If not, it'll be on the screen behind me. This is the parable of the wedding feast. And we're going to read through the first 14 verses and then try to make sense of it for our context today. Matthew 22, verse 1. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I prepared my dinner, my oxen and fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good, and so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is a lesser known parable than the prodigal son or the good Samaritan. And it's a little weird, if we're honest. It's a little harsh, isn't it? I mean, what kind of wedding feast is this where people get killed, slaughtered and killed and thrown out? We'll try to make sense of that as we go. Notice the text says that Jesus said to them again. Now he's telling a story. It's important to know who he's telling it to because that'll tell us why he's telling it and what he's getting at. Who's the them that he's speaking to? If you go back and look at Matthew chapter 20 and later in 21, you see that this whole thing happens in a discourse over time with a group of religious leaders, Pharisees, chief priests, teachers of the law. So this is the third in a series of three stories Jesus told to speak to those who were religious insiders, the religious establishment. And they are questioning his authority and his right to teach about the kingdom. In Matthew 20, we read about and we talked about a few weeks ago, the workers in the vineyard. You might remember that parable. Matthew 21, the, t the tenants. We didn't discuss that one. Matthew 22, here the wedding banquet. Different stories aimed at the same central principle. He says the kingdom of heaven is alike. Let's just start there. What's the kingdom of heaven, first of all? Where you float off someday in the clouds? 
No, the kingdom, it's a place where, where the king reigns. Who's the king? Jesus. The place and environment in which Jesus reigns, not just someday up there, wherever that is, but right here on this earth now and forever, is like what? Like a man who threw a wedding feast for his son. That's pretty cool. The kingdom of heaven is like a big party. Like a king who prepared a feast. This is no ordinary feast. This is no ordinary party. This is the feast of a king. Everything's ready. See on the screen here an image that I, this is from Google. I found this on Google. I think this is Westminster uh, Palace. That looks like a good party. Maybe not, some of you are like, no, I'd rather have a barbecue where I can wear my flip-flops. But anyway, what if you're, this is the kind of the environment. Now, it wouldn't look like that in the first century Palestine, but this is the feast of a king, a great, grand, glorious feast. This is not like a casual dinner invitation. The first point I want to make here is the call of grace. The call of grace. Verses 3 through 5 are very interesting in this story. Verse 3. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I prepared everything. And they still would not come. They paid no attention. One went off, one to his farm, the other to his business. It reads to us like the king does not give them very much time, right? Like he sends out invitation. It's like, you got to come that day. Well, who has time to prepare? I might have things going on. I might be busy. That's not actually what's happening here. Notice it says, he sent his servants to those who were invited, right? So think save the date card. They'd already received it. They already said we're coming. They already knew about it. Now everything's prepared. And he says it's time to come. That's the implication. So um, it takes weeks to prepare a feast like this, months even. And it takes a long time to prepare to attend. So he sends out an invitation. Hey, this, there's going to be a feast for my son's wedding. I want you to be there. That's an honor. It's an honor. Weeks go, weeks go by, preparations are made, and then he sends his servants, now's the time. So think of it like this for our context. Let's say you get a knock on your door one Sunday afternoon, and you look out the door, and there's a guy in a, dressed in a suit, and there's a couple secret service men standing next to him, and there's a stretch limo with a presidential seal on it, and the guy walks up and, and knocks on the door and hands you personally this gold embossed envelope, which is an invitation to a state dinner at the White House. And you're like, wow, I can't believe it. you and your whole family. We're going to fly you there in a private jet. If you're hung up on this, imagine you love somebody who's in the office there, okay? If that's your issue, right? So you get this invitation. And then the, that, that's months go by, and then the date comes, and the limo pulls up again. Same limo. It's time to go. They're going to fly you, they drive you to the private airport. You're going to get on your private jet and fly to D.C., you and your whole family. And imagine you say, ah, I'm watching Desperate Housewives reruns. I can't go. You know, I, I, was that today? I forgot. You wouldn't do that. That's unthinkable, right? You'd have been planning for this, excited, telling your friends about this, posting on Facebook. You'd be excited to go. That's the, that's the, the scene Jesus is setting here. The kingdom of heaven is like a party you can't imagine. And you've said you're going to come. And the king sends his servants, and then people decide, nah, I got stuff going on. I'm all too busy. Not now. Change my mind. It's ludicrous. Notice verse 3, it says, they would not come. In verse 5, it says, they paid no attention. Literally, the Greek word there literally means they were indifferent. Eh. Eh. That's a pretty good translation, actually, of the Greek word. Eh. I'm not interested. The king is really quite gracious. They refuse once. He sends his servants a second time. The first refusal is kind of an offense, right? An invitation by a king is more like a command. than, than an It's like it's not really that optional. And you say no, and he sends his servants again? Why didn't they come? Busy with their lives? Wasn't important to them? Now Jesus is showing us several things here in this whole encounter with the servants and the invitation. First, and I want you to be clear about this, nobody comes to the banquet unless they're called. There's nobody that slips in the back door. We'll deal with the guy with the weird clothes on later. But we'll get to him. Nobody comes to the banquet unless they're invited by the king. Now, if you're truly a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, I don't mean mildly religious, you go to church on occasion. I mean, if you've given your heart to Christ and you're trying your best, not a perfect person, but trying your best to follow him, you know that becoming a Christian was not your idea. You didn't come up with it. You know that you didn't decide, you were decided upon. 
that even when you first woke up to the reality that God existed and that his son Jesus is real and he died for you and has a plan for your life and he wants to have a relationship with you, that you realize that God was drawing you, that you didn't think that up. He was calling you before you responded, inviting you as it were. Second, this is the picture of what God has done in preparing his people Israel for the coming of the Messiah. Now, not all of us are Bible scholars, but those of you that read a little bit, you might know that in the history of the Old Testament, prophets come and go. But they're basically treated the same way. How do the people of Israel, God's children, treat the prophets? Prophets who are coming to announce God's plan, the Messiah. How do the people treat the prophets? Do they honor them? Bless them? No, by and large, being a prophet was risky business. It's a bad job to have. They killed them. They drove them out of their cities. They rejected them. Then John the Baptist comes on the scene. The one before the one to prepare the way. And they scoffed and laughed and rejected him. In fact, he had his head cut off by one of the Herodian kings. Then Jesus himself comes and says, the kingdom of heaven is upon you. And how do the people treat Jesus? Well, we know how, where he ends up. This, this parable it has historic implications, right? The king has sent invitation after invitation and prepared everything, and yet his own people, those who said they would be there, have rejected his invitation. Each announcement. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, Jesus says this when he looks out over the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you. So the first thing is you don't come unless you're called. The second thing is there's a historical narrative here. The third thing Jesus is showing us is that at a deeper level, there's something inside each one of us, our hearts, that resists the idea of a divine authority telling us what to do. The Bible calls this sin. Let me give you a little story to illustrate this sin, because sin is not a popular word today. The heart of sin, sin is not just breaking the rules. It's something in us that doesn't want to do what we're told to do. Wants to make our own way, make our own rules. My little niece Isabel is about the sweetest little girl on the planet. I've not met every girl on the planet, but she's got to be in the top ten. She's just a sweet thing. When she was two and a half years old, we were in Williamsburg, Virginia for Christmas Eve, my whole family. And she wanted pink cowboy boots and a pink cowboy hat for Christmas. And she got them. And she was very excited and would not take them off. I mean, never. We went everywhere, pink cowboy boots, pink cowboy hat all the time. Well, at night, you know, her feet are starting to stink and she hasn't bathed. And her, my sister Julie's trying to get her out of her cowgirl outfit and she won't take them off. She's a tiny little two and a half year old girl. It took me, my brother-in-law Luke, my dad, and my sister Julie to hold that girl down, kicking her boots and screaming. And she's like this. She's like, you are not the boss of me. You know, like, so she's, I, I still remember, we still laugh at her family. She's laying on the bed, like strapped down. You are not the boss of me. Well, yes, we are, you know. Now that's cute and funny when you're two and a half and you want your boop, cowboy girl boots on. The truth is about sin. Now you, some of you may walk out of here and reject this. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. The heart of sin is not breaking rules. The heart of sin is that place in your heart that says to God, you're not the boss of me. I don't have to obey. I mean, some of it, sure. Timothy Keller, in his book, Counterfeit God, says, the essence of sin is that there's something in every one of our hearts that would kill God if it could. When I read that, I wrote in the margins, ouch, and question mark, because I don't want to kill God. I just don't want him to bother me too much. I don't want to kill him. I just want him to leave me alone. You know, I want to do my own thing and I'm not hurting anybody. And Notice the, 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 the progression of responses. At first, those invited say, no, no, we're too busy. I got my business, got my family, got my farm. No, not too busy. The next time, they react with violence and hostility. The point Jesus is making is that casual indifference and open hostility to God are pretty much the same thing. Meaning this, if there's a God of the universe, I'm saying if, if he's real, if every galaxy in every corner of the vast expanse of the universe, only a fraction of which astronomers even know about, if, that, if that's all true, that he's made it all, put it all there, if he put every hair on your head and took them all off for some of you, right? 
If he knows all the days of your life before they come to be, if he knows every thought before you think it, every word before you speak it, if he knit you together in your mother's womb, if that God exists and he calls you, how are you going to say, meh, I'm a little busy now. I'll come later. I've got my own thing going. It's no different than open hostility because he has rightful claim if he exists, if he's real. Essentially, I couldn't care less about this king. I don't want him to rule over me. That's why verse 7, if you don't understand sort of the context here, sounds so shocking to us. In verse 7, the king is angry. Yeah, you think? This time he does not send his servants to invite them. What, who does he send? Armed troops. They level the city. Wipe them out. This is, sounds like the party is kind of getting out of hand. You know, like this is not good. Actually, many New Testament scholars see this specific verse, chapter 22, verse 7, as a direct reference to what would happen in 70 A.D. You know what happened in 70 A.D. in Jerusalem? Level the city. The Romans marched on a rebellion of the uprising of the Jews, a Jewish revolt, and they wiped it out, burned the city, tore down everything, every stone of the temple except for the foundation stones, those were too big to move. I've been to Jerusalem and, and saw them still sitting there. But everything else thrown down, wiped out. Again, Jesus is making historical prophecy as well as spiritual insight. Look at verses 8 through 10. He says then, so then, 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 then there's not going to be much of a party, right? They refuse, they get angry, they kill his servants, so he marches with the army. This is not turning out to be a very good wedding feast. Verses 8 through 10. He sends out his servants again. Listen, those that were invited have refused and acted unjustly, acted in sin. They're not worthy. Therefore, go to the main roads and invite anybody you find, the good and the bad. Let me explain that. The main roads is a Greek phrase that literally means the way where the ways cross. Outside of an ancient city in first century Palestine, there, would be, you know, there weren't a lot of roads in those days. There were lots of streets inside of a city, but not many roads outside. It's not like you know, the Eisenhower and 290 and 90 and all crossing, crisscrossing. It wasn't like that. A couple of roads leading into the city at most, maybe three or four. And the place where they would intersect and become one road leading to the city, that's the place it's referring to, the way where the way is crossed. Sort of the main crossroads just outside the city gate. And at that place, you'd find everyone and anyone. Young and old, rich and poor, male, female, lots of races, all cultures. You'd find all kinds of people there. The king says, go out there where you find anyone and anyone, everyone and anyone, and invite whoever you find, good and bad. Anybody, it doesn't matter. Whatever walk of life, invite them. And the wedding hall is filled with guests, we're told. Number, verse 10 says both good and bad. Well, how could you tell? That's the point. Didn't matter. Invite them. So you can't say, well, I was never invited. I was never called. The king didn't invite me. He has. He does. He is. And you must decide how you'll respond to this king's invitation, this call of grace. This brings us now to what we call, the, I'm going to call the covering of grace. The covering of grace. Or you could say clothing. Verse 10 ends, and you think the story should end, right? Let me read verse 10 to you. We can find verse 10. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. And so the wedding hall was filled with guests, and they all lived happily ever after the end. Like it should, should end right there, right? Great party. People got a out of hand. The king had to lay down the law, but there's a party in the end. Let's, let's all go home. Then there's this weird part of the story, verses 11 through 13. But when the king came in to see his guests, he sees a man who didn't have wedding clothes on. And he says, friend, how'd you get in here? Who let that guy in? And the man was speechless, and he throws him outside. What is this all about? And this is so weird that some liberal New Testament scholars have actually proposed that Jesus didn't actually say this. It's a later edition. There's no real evidence for that, but it's hard to make sense of, at least at first, what's really going on here. Let me tell you, God cares about fashion. That's what's going on here. He wants us to dress right, and if some of you are going to get thrown out, if I don't know, that's not what's happening here. The, here's the problem with the verses 11 through 13. In verse 10, both good and bad get in. Doesn't matter, right? Morally good, morally bad, righteous and wicked. Everyone's in there. And then in verse 11 through 13, if everyone and anyone's invited, and by the way, those who would have a universalist bent, universalist meaning, uh, stop talking about the gospel and Jesus and getting so narrow. Everybody gets into heaven in the end anyway, don't you see? Doesn't matter. 
We're all, it's, you know, God lets everybody in eventually anyway. If it's both good and bad, then why does this guy get thrown out? What's this all about? If God's grace is available to anyone and everyone, then why is this guy sent away? The answer is in his clothes. I don't mean his fashion. Would you go to a wedding for a friend wearing a greasy t-shirt, sweatpants, and flip-flops? Some of you might, and that's an issue, right? And most, of, most of you say, no, I wouldn't do that. You would only go to a wedding wearing inappropriate attire if what? If you didn't have time to change? Or it's all you had, right? The implication here is that the king sends out his messengers the third time to anyone and everyone, to the rich and the poor, to whoever he finds, and he says, come now. They don't have time to go home and change. Come now, the feast is ready, come now, and they do. The clear implication to the first century hearers of this parable, it's lost on us, is that the king would have provided the wedding clothes. I've invited you, I'll take care of you. I'll give you the right garments. Dress you all in white. Maybe someday in heaven we're all going to wear the same stuff. No more worried about, like, is this too tight? Does this make my butt look big? These don't fit. I don't like this. We'll all just dress and it'll be the same. But for now, it's not the case. So the point is the king dresses them. Those who can't afford the clothes and those who had no time to change, it didn't matter. The king clothes you. And then he comes to this guy who's not wearing the clothing the king provided. Now in the Bible, clothing most often refers to righteousness. And that's a weird word we don't use a lot today, but righteousness means to be right with. So if Dustin offends me, not that he has, and we, we talk it out, and, I, and he asks forgiveness, and I forgive him, and I'm like, are we good? Are we right? We're right. I mean, we're good, bro. We're right. Okay, good. We're right again. We're in right relationship with. To be right with God means to be in right relationship with God. The problem is there's a part of our hearts that says, you're not the boss of me. You can't be in right relationship with him. Unless the king calls you, you respond, and he clothes you. Let me read to you a couple of passages out of the New Testament that will help us maybe get a sense for what's meant here by this clothing. Actually, yeah, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have what? Clothe yourselves with Christ. Romans 13, verse 14. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Here's the point. When God, in his feast, in his kingdom, when he looks at you, if you have clothed yourself in Christ, then he looks at you and he doesn't say, how'd that guy get in here? She doesn't belong. He sees the righteousness of his son Jesus. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your junk, and we all have it. He sees you're clothed in his son who he loves. And so he looks at you and he says, my beloved, my son, my daughter, I love you. You belong here. Here's your place at the table. So that's why Jesus says at the end of the story, many are called, but few are chosen. Yes, call them all. Anyone can come. It's not exclusive. God's grace is expansive. It's infinite. But he must clothe you. You can't come in on your own terms. You can't come in shaking your fists going, I do what I want. I wear what I want around here. You must be, clothed, must be clothed in his righteousness. That's what he's talking about. That's what it means to be covered, clothed in Christ. Charles Spurgeon wrote a series of about a dozen sermons on this one passage. This sermon is a poor example of even one of his. But in one of his sermons, which I read, I love this line, he says, you always want beggars at your feast because the proper people, they criticize every dish, but beggars cheer for every plate. Do you ever cheer when your food comes to the restaurant? I do. <laughs> Seriously, do you ever do that? Do you ever look and like, do you ever look, come on, tell the truth. Do you ever see the waitress or the server coming and you go, oh, that's ours. I recognize the dish on there. Yes, it's coming. You know, to get excited. A little party in your head. Yay. The point of, this, of the story is this. 
None of us deserve to be at the wedding face, a feast. None of us have earned a place at the table. None of us can come in on our own merit saying, we belong here, we're the right people. We, none of us can. We're all beggars. We're all outside the city gates. We're all just worthless beggars who he, the king calls in, clothes us in the, in the garments of his righteous son and says, come on in. We should be cheering for everything. This brings us to the last point, the celebration of grace. There's a call of grace and everyone is called. There's a covering, a clothing of grace, and it must be in Jesus Christ that leads us to a celebration. C.S. Lewis wrote once, joy is the serious business of heaven. I love that line. Let me, let me just say to those of you, I've shared this a couple of times throughout the last several months, but my work as a pastor and being around people who are, have been Christians for a long time, my sense is that we hear a lot in our culture today about the church losing its influence, about Christianity being marginalized, a lot of fear inside of Christianity, inside of churches, about the election and about who's going to be in office and the world's going to hell in a handbasket and what's going to happen. And I, I'm not saying elections don't matter and I'm not saying that the, we shouldn't care about these things. But let me just tell you from my heart, we should not be known as the people who are afraid or anxious. The mark of those who love Jesus is joy. Joy, because the king has called me. And he clothed me. And I don't even belong here. But he gives me a place at his table. And nothing could shake that. I don't care who wins the election. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but not ultimately. Not in terms of his kingdom. God's not up in heaven going, oh no. Hillary or Donald, what are we going to do? He's not freaked out by it. It's his kingdom and his righteousness. There shall be no end to it. And whatever happens in our country or in our state or in our school system or on our street, we should care about those things. Those people matter to God, but ultimately shouldn't make us fearful people or anxious people or people walking around nervous about, oh no, we're losing our place. We should be joyful people. Celebrating people. You know, in the Bible, feast language, there's lots of it. It's always a reference to kingdom and to something more than just the food. Let me read to you an Old Testament and then a New Testament reference that will highlight this. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah writes this in verse chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, of the best meats and finest wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. There's a lot more going on there than just fine wine and good, good food. Then in the last book of the Bible, the New Testament, the book of Revelation, which by the way, we're going to look at this book in depth next series if you want to come back. Um, it's Images of Jesus and Revelation. People think Revelation is Revelations. It's not multiple, it's one Revelation. And it's not about the end times. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, of who he is. Listen to this description. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready, with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. That's a lot more going on there than just a great banquet. It's talking about the hunger of our hearts. Feast language in the Bible, banquet language, party language, is talking about the deep in our hearts, the desire to belong, the desire to matter, the desire to be significant, the desire to be accepted, the desire to have a place. That's what it's talking about. And in Christ, you do. You belong, you matter, you're accepted, you have a place. And that's how we're supposed to live in this life. Let me finish with this little story. It comes from out of World War II. Murdo MacDonald, there's a good Scottish name, huh? He was a British paratrooper, captured in battle during World War II by the Nazis, put into a prisoner of war camp. But by mistake, he ended up on the side of the Americans. They had separated the British soldiers from the American soldiers. They didn't want them communicating any information across those lines they might have received in their own regiments. Murdo McDonald was a strong Christian, and so he was kind of a de facto chaplain to the American side. The other chaplain on the British side was also a Scot that Murdo knew from childhood, as the story goes. And the 
uh, the guards in that prison camp, the German guards, would not allow the prisoners to uh, talk, but they would allow the chaplains to meet once a, a day at the fence that separated the two compounds to pray. They realized that the guards spoke German fluently, of course, French, and a little bit of English, but they did not speak Gaelic, of course, which was the native tongue of both these men from Scotland. So the guards would pray and talk and share about how the men were doing in Gaelic every day at the fence. McDonald says, this went on for months. One of the men on the American side had fashioned a shortwave radio out of stolen parts and hidden it in their, in their barracks. And he got news through that shortwave radio from the American radio broadcast that the German high command had surrendered. But the guards in the camp didn't know this because communication had totally broken down on the German side. So they met at the fence the next day and McDonald says, the war is over. We, we won. The war is over, they've surrendered, we won. But for four and a half days, they were still prisoners. Here's what McDonald writes about this in his journals. He writes, I took that news to the fence today and I gave it to my friend and that day I stood the fence and my friend and I went into the British barracks, waited for what I knew would happen. There was a thunderous roar of celebration from the British barracks and the most amazing thing happened. For three and a half days, prisoners of war walked around the camp singing and shouting. We were gloriously happy. We cheered, hugged the guards. We didn't complain about the food. We waved the dogs and the guards. No guard knew what was happening. They all thought we'd lost our minds. Nobody could explain it. Every prisoner of war was rejoicing and celebrating for almost four days. On the morning of the fourth day, we prisoners woke up and realized something was different. There were no guards. In the night, the guards had been informed about the surrender, and they fled for their own lives, and the gates were thrown open. So the point is this. this is, if you're a child of God and belong to Jesus Christ, this is how you're supposed to live. You have the news that the war is over, the king has won, and you're on the winning side, and you have a place at his table, and nothing can change that. And so we should go through life not fearful and anxious, but full of joy and celebration because even if it doesn't feel like it in the world sometimes, we know the good news. We know the good news. We should be living this life full of joy and celebration. If you'll allow me, I'd like you to stand and I'll lead us through a closing prayer. For many of you here tonight, I, just want to rem- I-, I think this is a reminder to you because we forget, we slip into being fearful and small-minded. But perhaps some of you are here tonight, and this is new, and you don't know. I want you to, be, I want you to know that the king calls you because he loves you, longs to clothe you in the righteousness of his son. Let's bow. Father, we thank you for this amazing truth, and we, we ask your forgiveness for being short-sighted and small-minded people. Lift the eyes of our hearts beyond the daily events of our lives. Fix them on your glory and your kingdom. There's nothing else worth living for. Thank you for this incredible news that we are all just beggars at the King's Feast, clothed in his righteousness. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and for loving us. We pray this in your name. Amen.